Welcome to today's video where we're gonna be talking about my top five favorite programming tips and tricks for working with MA2. Now, this video was voted on as the next topic on my channel by my supporters over at Patreon. I gave them a couple options and the majority of people said that they wanted to learn more about what my personal five favorite tips and tricks for MA2 are. And uh, I decided to go a little bit of a different route with this because there are features that are built into MA2 that are super useful, but I wanted this video to be more about the little nuanced things about the software that maybe not everybody knows, um, but can really, really help with those other features of MA that are maybe a little more well known and and I'm hoping that this video will kind of allow you to dive a little bit deeper into those really useful features. I've got my uh, five items here written down and we might as well just start going through the list, right? The first one on my list is being able to assign worlds to executors. Now, what does that mean? If you're not familiar with either of those terms, an executor is either a button or a fader, either virtual or real that you can physically touch that plays back the data that we've stored into the console. And worlds are restricted access. So if I were to have a show file that has the entire stage in it, if I were to enter a world that only had my spots fixtures in it, then I would only be able to modify um, the, the spot fixtures. Everything else would be uneditable. So this can go one step further because if you assign a world to an executor, it acts as an output filter. So we have filters and worlds and they kind of work uh, in similar ways, but filters act as an input filter for sequences and worlds kind of serve a double duty, both as restricting access in the programmer and restricting the output of executors. So let me give you a really good real world example of this. My color picker, even though it looks like it has a whole ton of buttons and a lot of sequences going on, I really just have one sequence for every color and all of the fixtures are stored into those color sequences. So I have a sequence for white that is just one cue. I have a sequence for red that is one cue, so on and so forth. And then all I have to do is assign th those sequences to a set of executors and then assign, say that my spots world or my beams world to individual rows. And so if you look at my uh, sequence pool, my color sequences have a, a cyan or a teal number 13 in the corner. And that 13 means that that sequence is assigned in 13 different places in the show file, but it's the same data. So what I'm doing is I'm just consolidating all of my cues into one location so that all of my cues that have just the, the color white stored into them, uh, I can have that all in one place and edit that all in one place and then just restrict the output later. And worlds don't have to be by fixture types either. You can have them be sections of the rig. So you could have only the center section, uh, store that to a world and then assign that to the executor. And then only when you press that button, uh, white is only going to happen uh, in that world. It's a really, really cool, really powerful feature. If you wanna get more into setting up your busk file to be really, really versatile. Okay, next one. This one totally blew my mind when I saw someone do it for the first time, and I'm hoping that I'll also blow your mind a little bit here. Uh, that is, if you have a 3D stage in your patch, or I guess I should say, if your fixtures in your patch have 3D information um, associated with them, you can create layout views basically automatically. Um, if you grab all of your fixtures in the programmer and store them to a new layout pool, and then go into the setup options of the layout and go to arrange, there is an option in there called camera. And if you click on camera, you get a pop-up of like I think nine or so different cameras in the MA3D world. If you go to top view 2D or front view 2D, really whatever suits your rig better, I usually end up doing both on separate layout views, and you hit apply, then all of your 3D information will be translated into your layout view. So this means you no longer have to spend time you know, organizing and aligning all of your fixture elements 
on a layout view. Uh, this, I can't believe I used to do it all manually before. Uh, this is one of those tricks that <laughs> once you see it, you can't unsee it and it saves so much time on every show. Okay, next one. This one's also a huge time saver and really great for instances where you're either doing some really intricate programming or um, uh, just for example, like corporate events, I use this little trick a lot and it is the fixture at fixture programming method. So uh, the at key is really useful for pulling data from one source into your current selection. So for example, if I select one fixture and I want to take the values from another fixture and apply it to my current selection, I just grab my first fixture, hit the at key, and then select a second fixture. And now all of the values from that second fixture will go over and be in the programmer for my first fixture. I've used this uh, pretty much every day in programming since uh, I figured this one out. So it, really useful for all sorts of scenarios, I'm sure you can imagine, and it references presets. So you, even better. Okay, this next one is cool for all of you people who like building layout views and changing the colors of things with macros. And that is that you can change the appearance or the color of pool items, um, executors, really anything that can have an appearance or a color in MA2, uh, you can use this trick with. And that is doing an appearance at an existing pool item. This is kind of like the previous trick with fixture at fixture, except you can do a uh, pool item appearance pool item, where if I want to make a group icon, the color of let's say uh, red, um, normally if you were to just do appearance, you'd get a pop-up menu and you'd have to go to the swatch book or change the color on the HSV sliders. That, that takes way too much time. So instead what I did is I just created a row of macros that are all just dummy colors. The macros don't do anything. They have, there's nothing in them. All they are is they're a placeholder for the appearances. So I have, I think like 15 different empty macros and all they are labeled is just colors. So what you can do is if you're doing some fancy macro tricks and you are creating your own user interface with layout views, then you can use the, uh, let's see, it would be the destination appearance source. So I would say group one appearance macro white, and then that will change the appearance of my group one pool icon. It sounds kind of, uh, it, I guess, a little bit of a roundabout way of doing it, but once you realize the implications of this, this means that you can have different buttons, different colors in different situations, and that can give you a visual feedback of um, what your show file is currently doing. Okay, last but not least, this is number five on my list of top five MA tips and tricks. Uh, and this one is kind of a cop out because it is just a built in feature, but I don't see, I don't see people using it enough. And that is the blind editor. I don't know if you guys knew this, but MA actually has two programmers per, uh, user that are signed in. Okay. You've got your main programmer, which, uh, everybody is used to, right? You select fixtures and then you start modifying values and you can see them output to the stage. They're, it's outputting DMX, right? Uh, the blind editor is a second editor and they never interact with each other, okay? Once you're in the blind editor, it's like you're turning a whole new page and you're, you're starting from scratch. And what people don't realize is you can enter and exit the blind editor at will and the data still stays respective to each programmer. So if you're doing some fancy work with macros and you're copying and storing and doing all this stuff in the background, you need to be doing it in the blind editor. And if you ever see on someone's show file, if like the layout view like flashes red for a second, um, that is an indication that you're going into the blind editor. So if you hold down the blind key, uh, for about a second, it will flip you over into the blind editor and you'll see red frames around your windows and it'll start flashing and blinking at you to indicate that you are in the blind editor. Uh, and this is where you have all the same functionality as the regular programmer, 
but it will never output to the stage. So if you need to do something in the background that you know will not accidentally fire, then the blind editor is, the blind editor is really useful. Um, it's also useful for just keeping track of what is what, right? So whenever I'm doing some complex macros, the first thing that I do in a macro that is editing values is I will go into the blind editor, so I'll be blind edit on, and then I will clear everything out of the blind editor. And then from there, I know that my, my slate is totally clear. So no, ma no matter what I was doing before I pressed my macro that goes into the blind editor and changes all sorts of stuff, I know that if I was like focusing some lights or changing some values, that my programmer that is outputting to the stage is not affected by the blind editor. And that is just like the most powerful thing for busking and macros and managing data in your show file in a live situation. Um, also works in uh, MA3D. So if you have MA3D connected, um, the blind editor can output to MA3D, but not to your real world stage. So really useful stuff there. Okay, those are my top five tips for now at least on working with MA2. Did I miss anything that you think is a really, really cool tip or trick? Well, let me know down below in the comments. I look forward to reading them and I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.